Hello friends, and welcome to my new video in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories down in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, Neighbor turned my life into a nightmare. He didn't realize he was dealing with a lawyer who could screw him up. I reside in one of those doubled up houses where two houses are built next to one another and mirrored layouts, sharing only a wall but being entirely dependent from one another. A nice old lady lived in the house next to me for many years. You never really noticed her or had any issues with her. The problem started when she passed away and the house was sold again. I'll use the name Jack Sparrow as the target for reasons that will become clearer later. Jack runs a sizable construction company and also dabbles in real estate. He purchases the home and leases it to a group of foreign laborers who perform construction work for his company. I say foreign because it's important to the plot. There are whispers that Jack is pulling some dodgy moves to get these people to work for him for dirt cheap by posing as their country's national workers and paying them at that rate rather than the far higher minimum wage in my country. Not exactly in good standing, there may also have been unreported labor. Anyway, he packs four to six of these into the home so that they may stay there while they work there. I don't currently have any issues with foreign construction workers. These neighbors, however, have two characteristics that are particularly problematic. They are exceedingly noisy, and they could care less about anyone else. From Thursday night through the entire weekend until they leave at 5 a.m. on Monday to go to work, we're talking non-stop music and partying. They literally do not stop, so I have no idea when or how they manage to sleep. Since it appears that they have chosen the living room, which is adjacent to the shared wall, as the party area where the fun happens, we're talking I'm wearing headphones but still cannot hear my own sound over their loud music. I initially play the neighborly role and just put up with it, and rationalizing that it's just one party, just one weekend. But after the third consecutive one, I went over to ask them to tone it down, because, you know, it's technically against the law to play loud music at night. My other neighbors across the street have also complained and can hear it on the other street. I receive a half-spoken, so sorry, we'll fix. However, nothing is altered. I return several more times, getting irritated each time, only to be told, but it's not loud. It is indeed too loud if I can hear your music in my home, over my own television and music. Since Jack is their landlord, I get in touch with him and explain the situation. I then receive an abrupt, sorry, not sorry, not my effing problem. Jack essentially told me to get effed. As a result, I involve the police and contact them whenever things get out of hand. It becomes obvious that even routine police interference doesn't assist the situation after around a dozen calls, sometimes even twice in the same night. I should point out as well that I practice law. I am aware of the appropriate course of action here. Additionally, I am aware that the most I will receive is a token paper from a judge stating that their music is too loud. Things would, as they occasionally had, turn into a game of cat and mouse in which they would play loud music for a short period of time to annoy me or wake me up so that by the time I could gather evidence or the cops arrived, there would be no more music. I'm stuck, and the only thing I can do now is pretty pointless and wasteful. One day while I'm at home, I hear a lot more noise than normal coming from next door. Suddenly, I notice that a wall is being partially torn down via my garden window. As you can see, these neighbors had eventually constructed a little neighboring side building next to the main house. It was directly across from us, and in order to save money on fencing when the gardens were refenced, the wall was used as a partition. A crane was currently tearing the top portion of that wall off. Although it wasn't technically necessary, it would have been polite to have told me of all of this. I go outside to observe what we're doing and discover that they have completely destroyed the side building, leaving only the wall separating our gardens intact, but not the top portion. As a lawyer who focuses on building and permit law, I am aware of these two things. One, this sort of behavior is prohibited absent a city permit that has already been issued. Two, there is absolutely no way that they could have attained that permit, as I would have seen the application, 
I frequently check the online public accessible to everyone application to see what permits are being requested for my job. And when I do, I usually look over to my own area to stay up to date with what is being planned in my area. That's it. The situation has shifted and now is the perfect opportunity to exact the retribution that I've been waiting for. I may fulfill my civic responsibility to report a potential crime, that is, someone constructing or demolishing crap without a permit, by sending a fast email to the local authorities. Since this is only a simple report and I'm not yet an official victim or anything, there's no reaction. More building supplies are delivered the next week and construction gets underway. I update my email to municipal services with new images stating that it appears that more is planned and expressing my hope that they take the necessary steps. Immediately, after less than one hour, after the initial contact to tell him what he was doing needed a permit, they had phoned Jack again and he had assured them that he didn't know that BS, he's in construction, of course he knows, and that he would halt working and apply for a permit. After I sent them an email, they contacted him once more and told him off for breaking his earlier agreement to shut it down. Later that day, Jack calls me in a rage, accuses me of having reported him. He also threatens to sue me for damages for his delays and says that I would be sorry if he did. I kindly inform him that even if I reported him, reports are under my name but they are kept confidential and removed from later files, I wouldn't have broken any laws because, based on appearances, he lacked a permission and ought to have known that before he began operating unlawfully without one. I cut the call short before I sound very content with the situation. But after some research, I learned that the house's former owners had actually spoken with one another about the side building and decided to utilize the wall as a barrier between their two gardens. They valued it so highly that they split the price. The ownership, too. The portion of that wall that he tore down? It was my wall. Of course, this implies that I am entitled to compensation. But that's not the crucial factor. I then complained against the permit in accordance with the correct procedures, arguing that even if it were approved, it could never be put into action because Jack needed my consent to build this wall and I didn't give it to him, nor did I intend to. Since permissions cannot be issued if it is known in advance that they will not be realized, this should revoke his permit. It makes no sense to provide a permit for the construction of a specific type of house when you know it won't ever be built. As a businessman in the construction industry with connections, Jack was a bit of a smooth talker. However, obtaining permissions in this situation is just as much a political as a legal issue. As a result, his visa was granted, despite a completely valid legal objection that should have prevented it. He even called me to slightly boast about it. No need to fear. In my nation, one can appeal a permit. The only prerequisite is paying a 100 euro charge, which I did with pleasure. The appeal instance is subnational instance, so it couldn't care less about Jack's connections to the political system or the clumsy arguments that city officials used to issue the permit despite my reservations. Without any hesitation, they revoke his permit on the aforementioned legal grounds. Jack's permission is suspended until he resolves the problem, which he can't do, as you can see, and I don't really like his ideas for our wall. After two lengthy surgeries, it has now been more than seven months, a construction project that was always intended to be a temporary thing for a few weeks while we build, nonetheless took months, with no end in sight, forcing the neighbors to store their belongings elsewhere. He obtained the permit, which was the administrative aspect of this situation as stated above. Now, it's illegal to perform building work without a permit. Naturally, my information was forwarded to the right people, and as a result, Jack was now the target of a criminal investigation for a construction infraction. Not only had he ran the possibility of being fined and imprisoned, but also utilized his own construction company to perform the work on the property. His company was also responsible, and one of the punishments for these kinds of offenses is a prohibition against engaging in building or construction-related business activities either permanently or temporarily. His entire company was on the line, in addition to himself. That's where we are right now, anyway. Jack is set to face a criminal court proceeding where he is putting his company and way of life 
in jeopardy. Since he's now been exposed to the city authorities as someone who skimps on permits and regulations, his ongoing projects also receive more scrutiny. Since the property is currently in utter despair and cannot be sold unless a significant loss is made, he is really at a loss, because all development plans call for the neighboring wall, which he's prohibited from using in significant ways without my consent, he is unable to develop it or to sell it to a developer. The noisy neighbors are forced to live in a smaller home than they had, and in a location they wrecked, but that cannot be significantly remodeled or fixed, and they've become much more subdued, probably as a result of Jack blaming them for his current predicament, which isn't necessarily wrong, I suppose. The nicest part is that I didn't have to do much to complete it. All I really did was shove the city bureaucracy in its general direction, and they took care of the rest. I could tell you that he called me to complain, and even begged me to let me use the wall the way he needs to, so that he can get on with his business, fix the problems, and use them to demonstrate his good faith in court during the criminal procedure. And that I then smugly replied, Not my effin' problem. He was losing money and customers over this, and was in danger of losing his entire business, I could say. But because he didn't, we'll have to make do with the assumption that he did. I love when arrogant bees get what they deserve. He could have just talked to the workers and asked them to not disturb the neighbors, but he decided to be rude and say it's not his effing problem. That's why he got five times as much trouble. Dude didn't know who he was messing with, and karma catches up with everyone. It's really cool that you went out of your way to make sure that he got what he deserved, and most importantly, you did it in a very professional and legal manner. That's very commendable. Probably after this, dude will think three times before saying something rude to anyone. He was ruined by his own arrogance and indifference. I think it's cool that you didn't put up with this and made sure that he was punished. He took on way too much. Never behave arrogantly with other people, because there is bound to be someone who will do everything within their power to ruin your life in return. Very cool story here. I enjoyed such skillful and well-thought-out revenge. The next story is, HOA built a two-story giant parking lot for cars on my land. Hello. As a lover of the countryside, I decided to live not in the city itself, but in the so-called agglomeration, or more precisely, in a village near the city. My family farm was very remote from all kinds of hustle and bustle, and my family and I really appreciated it, because this kind of situation really gives you a sense of freedom, which is very satisfying. Also, one of the key factors was the fact that living in such a place, you know all the neighbors, and the neighbors know you. And if anything, you'll actually get help. Actually, I was wrong to think that. Because after what happened, I realized that in case of a bad situation, no one would want to help you and would pretend that they didn't see anything. One summer, three years ago to be exact, when I was returning from a business trip, my family was also in another city at the same time, but not for work, but at my wife's sister's place, I saw something that surprised me. My quiet farm had been turned into a parking lot. As I found out later, it was a parking lot for 75 cars. The local HOA had always dreamed of expanding to my land, but I didn't even give them hope for that and always refused to do so. They stole my land without my permission and then claimed that they thought it was an abandoned plot. So according to some rules, they have the right to become the new owners of this land, to turn it into a plot useful for the public. In all cases, this HOA acted like a-holes. I know for a fact that they did it on purpose and understood everything perfectly well, but even if they didn't really understand it, they should have checked all the documents before doing it because what they knew for sure was that it was my private land. By the way, it's a funny fact that when I started talking to them about it and trying to find out something, they find me. To solve a problem of this magnitude, of course, you cannot do so without a lawyer. My lawyer, let's say his name is Alex, 
is a real professional in his field and has a very large portfolio of similar cases, so I trusted him 100% in this case. We very quickly filed a lawsuit against this HOA because we had evidence that could be called indisputable because it's mega easy to prove that I'm the owner of this land, but it is impossible for them to prove that I gave them the right and consent to use my private property in any way or even to enter it because I did not actually give them any such right. I didn't even know about their plans. Another key thing was that they had no idea that there were about five hidden cameras on my land, two of which were pointed exactly where they needed to be. So the video showed the faces of the people who were doing it and the people who were managing it. Almost all of the HOA managers, including the most important one, were visible on my CCTV footage. While the legal processes were moving forward and heading towards a confident victory, we decided to make sure that as many people as possible knew about this situation. We thought carefully about all the pros and cons of doing so, but still decided that the pros outweighed the cons. So the plan was launched. My friend, who I've been friends with since childhood, worked in the local media in our city. So it was very easy for me to make sure that this story became known among people. We think that the media coverage of this story really helped us. At the very least, it gave us a certain head start, because although we had indisputable evidence, people, or rather neighbors, were very loyal to the head of the HOA and all of his deputies, so everyone thought that I was making a big mistake by starting to defend my position. The court verdict was a clear victory for me. If you ask, what did you get after winning the case? I would answer you that it's more appropriate to tell you what the HOA lost. First, the HOA lost all its loyalty from anyone. The neighbors finally realized who was who in the situation, so I even received apologies from the people who were trying hardest to prove me that I was doing something wrong. The negative publicity led to people trying to stop being part of this HOA by any means necessary. Secondly, the HOA was obliged to restore my private property to exactly the same condition as it had been before their construction. Thirdly, the HOA had to pay me a large amount of compensation, as well as pay all my expenses for the process. The amount I received reached hundreds of thousands of dollars. In the end, this HOA ceased to exist, although they tried to save their reputation. As I understand it, their reputation, which had been earning for years, brought them in a lot of money. I think you can see how they would convert their reputation into money. For example, they could fine a person for doing something wrong with their house renovation and then make the person buy building materials to rebuild the house in a store with the owner of which they have a contract, i.e. they get a percentage for the HOA, etc. As a result, the HOA ended its rule over our neighborhood with no money and no reputation. I also forgot to tell you about what happened to those who helped them. The company from which they hired the builders also lost a lot of money and ceased to exist even before the HOA. Not only was I able to keep my private property, but I was also able to finally help people open their eyes. To be honest, I'm glad about that even though I don't really respect my neighbors after none of them even called me to tell me that something was happening on my private property. The next story is, New creative director stole my design for his new business. I'm appealing to a lawyer. I used to work as a web designer for a tiny advertising company that catered to a very specific market. The design team was previously working on several clients without any form of direction from a creative lead, we made the decision to employ a creative director to fill that void, and I was tasked with selecting and conducting preliminary interviews with candidates to choose the person who would eventually supervise me. For quite different reasons, two candidates in particular stood out from the crowd. One was incredibly talented, a lovely guy in general, and someone who would have been perfect for the job. The other, let's call him John, was just averagely talented and came across as an unbearably haughty jerk. 
but he had prior experience working in the specialized sector that we catered to. Additionally, he had connections in that sector that might result in new business. Although I strongly advised against hiring John, our agency's leadership decided to do so because of his connections in the businesses. The entire business quickly came to the conclusion that John was a major burden. He has essentially no background in any kind of digital design, despite the fact that he had no experience with designing for apps, websites, mobile, etc. He exploited his position of relative power to make decisions on those projects, even though the entire design team opposed them. And the majority of them, those mistakes, ultimately cost the company its bacon. The design team despised him since we had to spend our days correcting and avoiding his mistakes. He would claim it took him incredibly inflated lengths of time to finish even the most insignificant of tasks. For example, four days to develop a business card template. So the sales staff despised him as well and stopped even giving him projects. Clear work that fell under his purview began to quickly flow down to the rest of the design team. Because all of the projects that were in risk of missing deadlines would be reassigned to us, we would be working late nights four out of five days per week. In the meantime, he would always be the first to leave the office at exactly 5 p.m. every day. In addition to all of that, that man was without a doubt the biggest tool I have ever encountered. Everybody in the building prayed that he would be struck by a truck since he was infallibly correct utterly unwavering in his ridiculous beliefs and completely illiterate. I tried my best to work with him for approximately a year before deciding that he was the reason the job had become intolerable and that it wasn't going to get any better anytime soon. I then gave my two-week notice. A month or so after I left, I learned that he had lost his job. A short while later, I saw that he had modified his LinkedIn status to reflect that he was now employed by a brand new company that I had never heard of, and that it catered to the same specialized industry. When I looked them up, I discovered that he had founded his own company, one that focused primarily on digital, despite having no prior experience with interactive or digital design. He had also utterly failed every project that he had ever worked on. I know this because the majority of them were given to me when he was unable to complete them on his own. I glanced through his website's portfolio and discovered project after project of my work there. As examples of the type of work his agency could generate, he used my work from the advertising agency. I briefly pondered getting in touch with him, asking him to take my work off of his portfolio due to ethical concerns. However, I was already hearing his response in my brain. All of my team's work, as the creative lead, is an extension of my creative direction. He had previously inserted himself into gaining credit on successful projects that he had no part in. Instead, I wrote a letter to one of the agency's partners, saying something like, Hey, not sure if you've noticed this, but it looks like John is using your company's intellectual property to directly compete against you. If I had to guess, I'd assume his next step would be to move at your client list. Short and to the point, they said, thanks for bringing this to my attention. In the morning, he'll hear from our attorney. And in less than 24 hours, John's website was taken down. Nothing pisses me off more than someone trying to make someone else's work look like their own. I cannot stand impudent thieves of other people's property and sincerely do not understand how this kind of person is not ashamed, disgusted to steal other people's work. I am so glad that you did not ignore this situation and also noticed the use of your intellectual product and decided to take action. Through your determination and courage, you've helped to prevent others who would have most likely have believed the thief from being deceived. You should never mess with shady guys because they can throw you into such a huge hole that you'll never know how to get out of it. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment. See you soon.